It took me some time to make a video about Windows 11 because I wanted to run it for some time to see if problems creep up with some apps or not. Now I've used it for a couple of weeks for my everyday work. I even edited some videos with it and I recorded some videos with it. So far it's very stable. There are no major issues. Now I have to say for a preview from Windows Insider, that's quite amazing. The upgrade itself was pretty much painless apart from the TPM issue, but more on that later. Good news. All apps work as they did before. Everything just looks a bit fancier. Now, I don't have a Mac, but it does look similar to what I've seen on a Mac. But at the same time, it's also not dramatically different to Windows 10. So I'd say if Mac and Windows had a kid, that's probably how it would look like. But is it just about the looks? So some say it's a glorified theme pack with aesthetic updates like rounded edges, icons or fancy icons and animations. Now, is that it for the new version or is there more? Let's find out. Let's start from the beginning, the upgrade process. So I used one of my older desktops with a seventh generation i7 CPU that I bought about four years ago. I ran the requirement checker called why not win 11 and it came back with two issues. Number one, my CPU is not currently listed as compatible. Now that's strange given that it's not that old, but it doesn't seem to be a showstopper. But then it tells me that a TPM, which is short for Trusted Platform Module, is missing and is marked in red. There's no upgrade without that. After doing some research, I realized that this is the most common issue when it comes to upgrading to Windows 11. Another common problem is secure boot. In my case, it was fine, but what's the big deal about these requirements that Windows 11 has anyway? So honestly, I kind of felt bad that my devices are not good enough for Windows 11. So does that mean I can't install it? So I'm no IT expert. I've never come across this before. So I did some research and it turns out that both components, so both TPM and secure boot, increase your system security. So it sounds like a good thing. It's something that I would expect my device to have though, if it's just four years old. So what are these things anyhow? A TPM is a tiny system component that stores encrypted data. So think of it like a vault that keeps important information safe from malware or from a hacker. For example, biometrics like fingerprints or facial recognition data to sign in with Windows Hello. Windows 11 requires TPM 2.0, which only devices from the last five to maybe seven years are gonna have. But even if you have it, it may be disabled, like it was in my case, and then you end up getting that red mark that your device is not good enough. But it's just disabled. So don't worry, you can enable it yourself if you have it. You'll just need to access your BIOS settings and look for security settings. On Intel systems, it's usually called PTT or FTPM on AMD devices. Now make sure to enable these. This way you can pass the TPM check. The other thing is secure boot. So this has been around for a long time. It's very likely that your PC has it too, but it may also be disabled. So you can think of the secure boot as a security guard. It makes sure that your computer only starts an operating system that's digitally signed and trusted. This prevents things like a malware sneaking in. Microsoft states that systems having TPM and secure boot enabled reduces malware by 60% on tested devices. So more security is generally a good thing, but it means that older computers and even some of the newer ones are not gonna be able to upgrade unless Microsoft changes the requirements, which wouldn't be that uncommon, and it's already happened in the past as well. Okay, so with the system requirements out of the way, the actual upgrade was easy. It took about an hour and it was painless like some of those Windows 10 fall updates that we had before. You don't have to reinstall any apps. Everything is there, just it looks a bit different. So your desktop will look different. That's the first thing you're gonna notice. The taskbar is centered, which takes some getting used to, but with a right click, you can open the taskbar settings and in taskbar behaviors, you can move it back to the left again. One thing I think will make a lot of people unhappy is the never combine feature. That's gone. With never combine, you could keep the windows of an app ungrouped in the taskbar. Now, since this feature is gone, they're gonna be treated like a single item until you hover over it. Other than that, the windows have a fresh and modern look with rounded edges. 
The start menu is cleaned up. There aren't any more of those live tiles, which I appreciate. A new action center was implemented with a modern look. You can get to it by clicking on this combined button for internet volume settings and battery down here, or by using the new shortcut, Windows A. Here you get a lot of central controls like monitor brightness and volume. The settings area also got a major overhaul. This is actually one of my favorites because navigation in settings is much easier than in Windows 10 where you always had to go back and forth. You can see all connected devices up here. Adding a new device is also super simple. With network and internet, you can get a breakdown of your data usage by app. Now that's pretty neat. With personalization, you can select a theme or change the background and colors. Now something I like is the possibility to add shortcuts to the start button. So right now when I click on start, I see a lot of empty real estate between my profile picture and the power button. This is where we can add shortcuts. Scroll down to start and then select folders and turn on what you use often. I'll select downloads and pictures. And now when you click on start, you'll see these icons and you can jump straight there. Windows 11 has also optimized touch experience that makes it much easier to use on tablets and convertibles. Tablet mode has gone, but it got smart. So when you detach the keyboard, it automatically adjusts. Touch targets are bigger now. For example, the taskbar spaces the icons out. In the file explorer, you automatically get more space between rows. It makes it much easier to select the right one. You get a customizable on-screen keyboard similar to the iOS keyboard. You can move around and it's also swipeable. So let's say I want to open Word, just swipe over the letters and here it is. When you swipe in from the left edge, you get widgets. You can also click the button in the taskbar or use the shortcut Windows W. Widgets are great to get a quick overview on the weather, news or your to-do, which is a widget that you can also add. This for me is super convenient. You can also use gestures like three fingers swiping down brings you to the desktop and three fingers swiping left or right goes to the last used app. I work a lot on my surface, so this definitely is an improvement for me. Another improvement is clipboard history. It got an upgrade as well. I use the shortcut Windows V all the time, but the one issue I had was that if you already have a lot of items in your history, you have to scroll all the way down to get to your pinned items. In Windows 11, you can now clear the history right here with this button, clear all, and only your pinned items remain. Now check this out. There are other tabs. We got emojis, GIFs, camojis, symbols. We get it all. You can also get to this view with Windows period. So this shortcut works in Windows 10 already, but now you get a wider selection. Next convenient feature, are snap groups. When you hover over the maximize button, you get multi-window snap presets. The shortcut window Z does the same thing. This way you can arrange your windows as you like. It's going to remember the setup even when you unplug your laptop from the external monitor. When you undock it, the windows will be minimized to fit them on the smaller screen. But when you dock the laptop again, it's going to restore the snap group that you previously had there. Another handy feature is the improved dictation that now comes with auto punctuation. So you don't have to dictate your punctuation. To turn it on, use the shortcut Windows H. Click on settings and enable auto punctuation. Then just click on the microphone and start dictating. If you don't see the microphone, use Windows H to bring it up. Hello, I'm testing auto punctuation. Yay, it's really working. Click on the microphone when you're done or just pause for a bit and it will stop, or just say stop dictation. This works great now. I said the same thing in Windows 10 and this is what I got. Hello, I'm testing auto punctuation. Yay, it's really working. So this seems to work well in 13 different languages already. The other new thing that Microsoft introduced is the built-in chat option from Microsoft Teams. This means that the default chat app in Windows 11 is not Skype, but a consumer version in Teams. You'll see the new chat icon on the taskbar. When you open it for the first time, you need to first sign in with your Microsoft account. If you use Skype or Outlook, you're going to get the option to sync your contacts. After you set up, if you want to get in touch with someone, you just have to click the chat icon in the taskbar or use the shortcut Windows C. You'll see your most recent conversations 
and you can respond or start a new chat or call. When someone contacts you, you're going to receive a notification and you can respond directly in line to text chats. This way, you're going to be able to connect with your friends and family. You have one-on-one -on -one chats, group chats, audio or video calls. And when this is completely rolled out, you'll even be able to do screen sharing, just like with the Teams business app. This makes it easier for me to help my dad with his Excel problems. So clearly Microsoft wants this to be the central communication tool for everyone. Now, most of us use Teams at work or in school anyhow already. So this makes it easy for us to use it in our personal life too. Now, what do you think? Can you see yourself switching to Teams for your personal communication? So instead of using WhatsApp or Signal, let me know below. File Explorer got a major overhaul too. The huge ribbon is gone. It's replaced with a clean toolbar. The right click context menus are also changed. The most common tasks are shown as icons up here. It's all streamlined and modern. If you don't want the extra spacing between the items, you can easily fix that in the layout and view options up here. Select compact view, and it's going to look like it did in Windows 10. The one thing that annoys me a lot is that there are still no tabs. So you still have to open multiple windows for tabbed browsing. I really hope that would finally be included so I don't have to use extra add-ins for that. Now I tested the current add-in that I use on Windows 10. There is already a better version for Windows 11 and it works fine. If you're interested about this add-in, I have a separate video on it. Now, another disappointment for me was virtual desktops. If you're multitasking, working on different things, it makes sense to have different desktops, right? It's really easy to set them up. In the taskbar with task view, you can create a new desktop. For example, let's say you want to have a dedicated gaming desktop. Just click on the plus, then change the name to whatever you want. Now you have a separate environment. What's nice is that you can have a different background for different virtual desktops, something that's not possible to do in Windows 10. But unfortunately, that's where the customization ends. The pinned items on the taskbar are the same. The desktop icons are the same. Now it would be nice if you could have all your gaming links in one desktop and all your professional programs and apps on another desktop. So this in my view, would make virtual desktops really useful. Now let's go back to gaming. So something that's not available in the preview yet is the Xbox tech that should come to Windows 11. So like auto HDR, which will make your games look a lot more vibrant and direct storage, which makes sure that your games load faster from your graphics card. Another thing that's currently missing in the preview are Android apps. But when Microsoft releases Windows 11 officially, you're going to be able to install Android apps. Now that's a big plus because so far you'd have to use the Your Phone app, which basically just requires a Samsung mobile if you want to get your apps to work. That will change with Windows 11. But where are you going to go to install your Android apps? You will go to the newly designed Microsoft Store. You can install any Android app as long as they're available in the Amazon App Store. This is where they're actually going to be coming from. So this bridging is a little bit strange for me. So I wonder how the performance of the apps will be. Now, what if you don't want to use the Amazon bridge to get to your apps? Well, Windows 11 may support side loading of Android apps. This way, you're not going to be dependent on your apps being available on the Amazon store. So let's see how things turn out. So let's summarize. I found the official Windows 11 Microsoft presentation quite dramatic. And I thought dramatic presentation, dramatic change. But don't get me wrong, the design improvement and especially the new features that they implemented for touch screens are great. But I just expected a bit more on the feature side. Now, if the auto HDR and direct storage for gaming happens as announced, and the bridging for the Android apps performs well too, it's definitely more than just the glorified theme pack, and I consider it well worth the upgrade. What do you think? Will you upgrade to Windows 11 once it's officially released? Let me know in the comments below. So I hope you liked this video. Please give it a thumbs up. If you did, do subscribe if you haven't already done so. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.